Today we're going to be talking about baptism. We're doing baptisms, and so I want to give you just a kind of a brief uh, talk about baptisms, why we do baptisms, um, and the reasoning behind uh, the baptisms, the overall reason, reasoning behind them. But first, um, let's open up in prayer. Gracious Father, thank you for bringing us here today. Father, I thank you for those that have come forward to make their proclamation of a change in their lives. Father, I thank you that we can still gather together as believers on this day and any day of our choosing. Father, I thank you that you move in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You know, if you look up there on that screen, you'll see uh, baptism, and you'll also see one of the, the, the core beliefs of the Great Commission, or the core action of the Great, what's called the Great Commission. This is when Jesus had gathered his disciples on a mountain and he uh, told them, he said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And that's one of the things that drives us in doing baptisms. This is a part of us going and making disciples of all nations. It is a part of us sharing the interchange with other people. And I, I know as I, as I look out here, I know a lot of you have been baptized. Now, there are a couple of key things that people do in our church when they're, get, when they're preparing to get baptized. The, the truth of the matter is, though, before we do baptisms, the change that people are proclaiming today or declaring today should already have been evident in their lives. This baptism is just a formality, okay? It, in and of itself, is not the change. And so I want you to understand that as we do this, what is going on in people's lives has already been declared. The other thing is this, just the word declaration. When we talk about baptisms with people and getting baptized, we discuss the declaration that they're making today. And I don't know if you know this, but to make a declaration, you know, we look at these words, and a lot of us have seen, seen these words many times, you know, about Jesus, you know, about to leave, and he's um, uh, counseling his disciples on going forward. But this is a very weighty thing. Let me tell you something. To make a declaration it is, is in and of itself a very weighty thing. You know, people declare things when they're about to go to war, you know, we all heard about the Declaration of Independence. When you make a declaration, you are making a very significant statement. A declaration informs people of a, of a very significant change that's about to take place. And it's not just a change of the moment. This is a change that's going to happen right now and forever or going forward. So a declaration is a very weighty thing. It is... The movement of your words, telling of your actions that will be taking place from now on. So the people that are getting to, to baptized today, declaring, making declarations, formal declarations of their beliefs and the interchange is a very strong thing and a very weighty thing. And us being told to make disciples of other nations is also a very powerful thing. To make disciples of other nations, I'm convinced that there are countries on this earth right now that are bigger in geography, you know, in real estate than America. They got more people than America, but they're not doing as well as America. There are a lot of countries, big countries, but the people live, literally live in garbage. You know, people literally live on the street. You know, they, they don't do as well um, financially, you know, or in, in any kind of way, really, as America does. And I'm convinced that a lot of America's success is still due in part to the beliefs of the people that established this country. And a lot of those beliefs are still echoed in our national monuments in Washington and um, just the fact that they established religious freedom here and the fact that we can't even gather here today like this. You know, this, let me tell you something. This is a right that we shouldn't take too lightly because there's a lot of countries where people have run from coming to this country so that they can do what we're doing, what we kind of take for granted, you know. We can walk up and down the street. I've seen people, you go downtown, you can see anybody down there talking on a street corner, telling you about the gospel. You can't, another country, they'd have shot you, you know, and leave your body there. You know, so 
Anyway, uh, I'm very happy that in this country we can still go forward and make disciples of all nations. We can fulfill this great commission in this country. And we need to be happy about that and moving in that. And I'm glad that the people um, that are being baptized today, I'm glad that they're making that, uh, making that step. Baptism, uh, this is a very powerful step. I mean, it's a... Uh, Man, there's so many implications in baptism. Man, this is, uh, it implies a very deep moral transformation. I don't know how many of you are, no, I see some of the faces familiar doing the bondage breaker. And we've been talking about some things, some ways in which Christians are called to change. And one of those ways is our moral behavior. So this baptism, as people get baptized, this is speaking of some very uh, depth, some very deep changes you know, significant moral changes. How many of you today can claim that those same thoughts and feelings you had the day you were baptized, that you are still intent on following those same deep moral changes, same deep moral transformation? Something to think about. Next slide, please. So, you know, the word baptism has a couple of different meanings. Um, there's that literal meaning, and there's a figurative meaning. And the literal meaning, what we, we baptize based on the literal meaning of baptism, which is taken from Matthew 3, uh, Matthew chapter 3, chapter 3, verse 11. I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So in that verse, you get the literal meaning of the word baptize and also the figurative meaning, okay? Literally, we immerse people in water. We literally take them back there, as you will see, and they are immersed completely, and then we bring them up. Figuratively, um, is you can see uh, in the next verse, taken from Acts 1, uh, verse 5. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And that is figuratively. And that means to overwhelm with something or to really compel or take over. You know, you've heard, you might have heard the phrase baptism by fire or something like that. That's a figure, that's a figurative. So anyway, um, we move in the brief, in the, uh, li sorry, the literal meaning of the word baptism. Next slide, please. We don't believe in sprinkling of water on the body. You know, some beliefs do, uh, but we believe in baptizing the way people were baptized in the Bible, the way Jesus was baptized, by full immersion. Baptism does not save you in and of itself. It is not salvation from sin. There are beliefs, believe it or not, who believe that the act of baptism is in and of itself salvation of a kind. That if you go in there and you have been doing all kinds of dirt out there and living any kind of which way, that you go in there and you get baptized and you literally, that's, that's it. You know, you're good. You know, that's not the way it works. As I said, by the time we get to this stage, by the time people are in this baptismal, you should have already seen the evidence of that change in their lives. This is the formality. This is the statement. This is the formal declaration. It's like a marriage. If two people get married, they don't just normally <laughs> meet that day and they go get married that same day, that same afternoon. Although, you know, I'm not excusing that. I mean, I'm sure it's happened. But the normal way is to, you meet somebody, you know what's coming before they get married. You can kind of tell where, they, where this thing is headed. You know where, where they like to have it headed anyway. Sometimes one or the other is surprised <laughs> by the answer. But uh, if all things being equal, you know, people, you know, being in love and everything, you know where things are going. And you should see the evidence of their relationship long before they get to the altar. And the same thing is the way with our baptism. So uh, it's not cleansing by itself. Um, it does not, again, this is based on the former statement, it by itself does not cleanse you from anything. So, next statement, please. It's what you do that cleanses, that has the cleansing power. It's your belief that has the cleansing power. It's your faith. It's God actually has the cleansing power. And it's our belief in that that 
uh, moves us and that provides the salvation. There's nothing that we do here in this water that actually provides the salvation. We do it also as an act of obedience, okay? The believer is doing this because we believe the Bible. As it says in Acts uh, chapter 2, verse 38, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. So this is a part of a process that we do. It is an, an act of obedience. Secondly, as it says there, public testimony. It is an outward confession of an inward change. And I've always believed that it's very important for Christians to act out, for the world to know our testimony. Our testimony isn't just something we act out here in church. People should know there's something different about us. And um, as it says there in Mark, uh, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. But people should know. This isn't just something that should be hidden. It shouldn't just, you know, you, uh, you believe and you keep, that, keep your, light, your light hidden, your lamp hidden. People should be aware of it. And your life should be the testimony. This is a part of your testimony. Where you live, how you live, at work, in your home, in your neighborhood. People should know there's something different about you. That's what I was talking about, the deep transformation. Um, the baptism itself doesn't have any power to transform. Only Jesus has the power to transform. But that transformation has to be evident. And I'm asking you today, if from the time you were baptized, is that transformation still evident? Does it still hold true by all the things you do, all the things you say, all the places you go? It should be evident. People sh shouldn't have to ask you, well, have you been baptized? They should know there's something different about you. Next slide. Baptism is an act representing profound spiritual truths. You know, I have always enjoyed the fact that here we see, here with baptism, we see the death and resurrection acted out by what people are doing. And this is a profound thing to keep in our memories as we move forward with our lives after baptism. From Galatians 2, um, uh, second chapter, verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You know, I would encourage all of you, all of us, these are words to consider and words to kind of, you know, keep in your mind and keep in your heart as we go forward. A lot of times, you know, it seems Christians, sometimes we forget that we're, it's, we're not living in our own lives anymore. I see Christians who, man, I'm wondering, man, what was that that just came out? Because that didn't sound like Christ. You know, the world, I've said it before and I will tell you again, the world will not see Jesus if they don't see him in us. And we must live that way. They've got to see him in our responses in our choices, the things we do, the things we watch. I've got to tell you, I don't believe that there's any rapists or murderers here, but I'm surprised at how many Christians don't have a problem watching that in a movie. Or on TV. Or acted out in a song. I enjoy music as much as the next person, but I'm careful about what I listen to. The body is a strange thing, and the mind is a strange thing. The mind is a very powerful thing. And you may not think that what you see and what you listen to has much of an effect on you. You may think, ah, oh, it's just me. I don't have to listen to that. I don't have to believe it. I heard that, but I don't have to believe it. But your mind is a very powerful thing. Let me tell you something. The mind is gathering experiences and taking information in that will come back to you in other ways. In the Bondage Breaker right now, we've been studying the impact of past experiences and past music on the mind and how these things come out. And as Christians, we have to be careful. It's not just the, the music itself or the scene itself. It's the choices we make in getting there. You, we must choose. We must choose to make, we must 
choose to, to get better material, to get the kind of material, the kind of information that is edifying to us as Christians. It does not edify me. Man, I, there was nobody, I'll tell you, there's very few people that probably enjoyed gunfights as much as I did. Um, on, in movies and on westerns. I, I still watch westerns, you know, sometimes. I mean, they're older westerns. They're not the, the new kind where, you know, cowboys got, you know, machine guns, pull, pull a mach pistol out of the pocket and it's a machine gun shoots 40 times. You know, this is the old gun smoke kind of stuff where, you know, they had to shoot six times and reload and it was, uh, you know, and, and they cut out, they, you know, they cut out, they were heavily edited. Nowadays, nothing is edited. <laughs> you know, it's scary, you know. I. I go to bed, I have nightmares if I watch some of it. But uh, <laughs> the thing is, as Christians, as a Christian, I've learned to watch what I watch. You know, and I, my transformation, I am hurrying towards that transformation. I want my transformation to be complete. <laughs> and as Pastor Jim has said many times, we can have our best life now. We're not to wait until we see him face to face to have our best life. You know, we can have our best life right now, but it depends heavily, it weighs heavily on the kind of choices we make as Christians. And people are always watching us. Believe me, as Christians, people are always watching. Because any mistake we make, any misstep, becomes an excuse for other people not to believe, not to engage in this lifestyle. This was never, it was never told to us that this would be an easy lifestyle. <coughs> You know, there's sometimes when it is just downright difficult. But I'm telling you something, it's worth it. The changes that we see now are worth it. We get rewards right now. So, this act of profound spiritual truths involves death, it involves the resurrection. We were therefore buried with him through baptism unto death in order that just as Jesus, or just as Christ was raised from the dead, through the glory of the Father, we too may have a new life. If we have been united with him in, like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. As we do these baptisms, it's a reminder that even though we perish, even though we have to die, we will be raised again. And we will be raised in corruptible. Next slide, please. The cleansing part is spoken of in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because he was raised, I'll be raised. I believe that. We believe that. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11, But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. You know, this baptism is a reminder that we are in a process of sanctification, that we are set apart, we are different. I heard Mary Ann today during uh, praise and worship. Right? She was, uh, we were, and if you were joking about her being peculiar. And we're, we're all peculiar. You know, we're all, we all should be peculiar, and there should be no shame in that. We're called to be peculiar. You know, people should see what we do and say, man, who, do, who does that? Who, who does that, man? Nobody turns that down. You know, nobody, nobody doesn't talk like that. Nobody listens to that, you know, but they should see it in us. Excuse me. You said I wouldn't be electrified if water got on this. But our sanctification is an ongoing process of change toward holiness. And people should see that ongoing process. You know, we, we, every now and then we will stumble. But we don't have to fall. Okay? There's always someone there to catch us. And we always simply repent and move on. But repent quickly. When, um, when we make those missteps, the idea is not to linger there. You know, just continue to move. And as we do these baptisms today, remember that this is a process. 
that the people that you see here are engaged in the process of holiness, just as we all should be. They should, you should have seen it in them, they also should see it in each one of you. We are justified, and as Pastor Jim always says, I like that example, justified is removal of penalty of sin and guilt, just as if, or just, yeah, how do you say it? Just as if I never sinned. Next slide, please. You know, um, and, I, and I've said it several times now, not to be redundant, but we are no longer um, debtors to the flesh. We no longer live in the flesh. Okay? All of us, there should be that transformation, and it is a difficult one. We are engaged in a war. We are engaged in battle, unlike anything else. I was watching TV last night, and I saw um, several channels. Went through several channels, and on each channel, it's like that. It's like there's only one script in Hollywood anymore, and each station had the same story: a group of people caught in some nutty circumstances. One, one, it was zombies. The other one, they were caught in a subway, and the other one, they were caught in a city that had some kind of force field around it, and, all, and they, they couldn't escape. Everybody had weapons of some kind, and it was the same story all over again on each station. And as Christians, let me tell you something, Our, the, the battle that we're engaged in, a lot of us think that we're going to fight the adversary and it's going to be like that. We're going to be in a situation where we have weapons and we know our adversary and, the, and that's the way the battle's going to be. Even our movies and all of our media would have us believe that when our enemy comes, he's going to be noticeable, he's going to be ugly, he's going to be fearful, and we're going to, eat, we're going to know to run. That's just not the reality. The reality is our adversary very often is quite seductive and will seduce us in, in the ways that you don't expect and will come at you at a time when you don't expect your weakest moment, when you're most down, you know, when you're most alone, most needful, when you're looking for an answer and any answer will do or he brings the answer you want. And so we're called, we've got to be mindful, we've got to be discerning. This battle that we're in is not like any other battle that's ever been fought. This is a spiritual battle. And our adversary can't be fought with carnal weapons. The change of our character, that is, the, our character is actually where the battlefield is, our spirits. And uh, as we were talking about in the bondage break the other night, we have the ability among us as Christians within our church, we have the ability to help heal one another, our responses. We have to change our how we respond to one another, how we live, how we treat one another. That's the battle right there. A lot of us are thinking the battle's going to be, you, you come around a corner and you can pick up a weapon and, okay, I see you, come on, devil, let's do this. It's not going to be like that. The battle is going to be, okay, um, anger, wells up, and then you front, somebody step cuts in front of you, anger, wells up in front of you before you even know what's happening. The battle is going to be keeping your mouth shut, you know, or being polite, you know, or, but also letting go, of, you know, giving it to Jesus. You know, Lord, I don't want this anger. That's not me anymore. I'm not angry this way. You know, y'all know. I've told you some of the things I've done, but that's not me anymore. You know, that battle has been won. I don't fight that battle anymore. But that's where the adversary wants us fighting. In those places where he, oh man, he's very experienced in those areas. And areas where we're quite often off balance and at our weakest. But he will try to trick us into fighting those battles in our own strength. You know, I can do this, I can tough this out. No, you can't. You know, he's been around a lot longer than any of us. Just let this thing go, turn it over to Jesus, you know, because the adversary's already been beaten. He will try to trick us into thinking that we have to fight that battle again, but we don't have to. So, um, as it says here in Colossians, or I'm sorry, I don't have it up there, but in Colossians 3.5, it says, Therefore put to death your members which are on earth, 
fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. These things have to be put to death. And all those things, when people are baptized, these things are being symbolically put to death. And they come back up. They have left these things behind. But the truth is they've left them behind long before they get into that baptism. Just as we all have, and we all can. Again, I want to stress that being in the baptismal itself is, you can be baptized. There are people that were, that were not baptized that went on to glory. The thief on the cross next to Christ. He never had a chance to get baptized. But Jesus told him he was going to be in heaven. So, remember, this in and of itself is not the thing. Okay, but this is a reminder, and this is telling you what, where our faith is. Next slide, please. And again, you know, we do it because it is a part of the Great Commission. We know that it, it means a great deal in Christ because he told us to do it. He emphasized it's important in his closing words here on earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. And you know what? You'll never know what he's commanded us if you're not reading. All of us have to continue to read. As we're transformed, reading is, a, I can't tell you the significance of it. Okay? We won't know if we don't read it. We don't know what we're supposed to do. We won't know what our lifestyle entails if we're not reading it. Next slide, please. All the way up until the very last hour, the adversary is going to be trying to deceive us. And so as we move forward, remember that we must put on the whole armor of God. Let me tell you something. There is never a time when any of us is going to have arrived. You know, we must all continuously be prepared. You know, we have an adversary, and he's very real. And as I just told you, he will come at you at times when you are most weak, when you're most vulnerable. And so we must be prepared by prayer. And the only way to do that is by prayer. 1 John uh, chapter 2, verses 18 through 19, remind us, it says, Little children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. And I'm telling you, it was dark then, it's getting darker now. We are in a point in this country, man, I'm telling you, we got, this is the last, this is the most powerful country in the free world, okay? Matter of fact, this is the most powerful country, I dare say, on the planet that I know of. I mean, unless some, somebody's got some secret weapon they haven't told us about. And yet, people, people are concerned, people are confused. Who should we choose as the next leader of the free world? Man, when people are in that trouble, something's wrong, you know? There was a time when you could make a very, very definite, clear choice, but it's hard for people now, and it shouldn't be like that. And it's not just our next leader, the president speaking, it's the next leader anywhere. I heard about a governor, I forget the, it was on TV, and I don't remember this governor, had um, got caught dealing drugs out the back of his car. You know, this is a governor. You know, this man is elected to lead, and that's what he's doing. And it's, it's just time. It's time for prayer. Next slide, please. So, I want to close. And in closing, I just want to tell you a reminder to remember this declaration. You know, remember this change that many of us here made. Don't love this world. You know, we must be transformed. As it says in 1 John 15, 17, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away in the lust of it. But he who does the will of the Father abides forever. 
you know, we have choices. And as Christians, we have to make choices constantly. We've all seen people, and again, this is something Pastor Joe said last Sunday. It's something I've actually seen. People walking around playing and doing Pokemon. And this is kind of the attitude. I got my, you know, I've seen people like this. And I don't, I'm not picking anybody out in particular, okay? So please don't think I'm talking about anybody here. Um, but I've seen people like this playing Pokemon and they're turning and turning this way and turning that way and just kind of, you know, in their physically, it's just the attitude of their body. And I thought, man, you know, how many Christians need to, number one, adopt that attitude? You know, it's an attitude of prayer to me. But how many Christians also need to be mindful of the choices we're making from moment to moment? You know, that's how we've got to get Christ in our lives, moment to moment. Because the adversary, we've got to be mindful. Like the Bible says, you know, we have to watch every thought, take every thought captive. Because the adversary will come up at any given time. And as it says in 1 John, the world is passing away. We can see it. It's evident. And so now is the time to remember our great commission something that we're all called to, every single one of us. You know, that applies to all of us. And so I challenge you, I ask you to remember that as we go forward today, as we do these baptisms.